Welcome back inside number 9, where for the final time in series 8, we enter the realm of the unknown. I'm going to share my thoughts and feelings on this finale, and there will be spoilers throughout. And if you want to dive into another realm of the unknown, check out the links below to our top secret project coming soon, The Horror Exchange. For now, let's talk about series 8, episode 6, The Last Weekend. <sighs> Wow. This one was not only the series highlight for me, but easily my favourite episode since Mr. King. The premise totally flips on its head in the third act, though what we are initially presented with is a simple setup. Steve and Reese play Joe and Chaz, a couple who are away on a weekend break together in a somewhat unkempt yet isolated country house. It's their ninth anniversary and Joe has cancer, so it's not known how much longer they have together, and from there on out, they experience the five stages of grief. These stages were identified by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her book On Death and Dying, which is referenced in the episode during a nice minor guest appearance by Sheila Reid. Now, obviously, the twist in this episode completely rewrites the context of many of these conversations, so what I'd like to do is talk about my thoughts on the episode pre-twist and the meanings I extracted from it. I think that the core to this episode was the dual performance from Reese and Steve. For me, in terms of acting, it was their best pairing of characters since Bernie Clifton's dressing room. What they both brought in this episode was just fabulous to watch. Their on-screen chemistry, both playing to their strengths, both with fabulous range. I think they smashed this episode, and I'll be more than happy to keep re-watching it purely based on their efforts. When it comes to the five stages of grief, which are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, we are shown these in an order, like chapters. It was a really clever framework to tie together the themes of the episode, and I loved how the five stages of grief were about several things. The main one is the grief towards Chaz and Joe's relationship with Joe's terminal illness, but we are also presented with Chaz's self-assessment of five stages of grief towards his pop music career, having sidelined his earthly pleasures and potential potential stardom in order to commit himself to Joe. And then, post-twist, the five stages are recontextualized again, which I'll cover a little later in the review. But regardless, the fact there were multiple stages of the multiple stages was a genius application here to add extra dimensions to the skeleton of this episode. When Joe and Chaz are tackling the grief of their relationship pre-twist, there's some remarkable moments. You can feel a sense of sincerity and authenticity between them. When it when it comes to terminal illness, people often refrain from discussing it or walk on eggshells for fear of accidentally saying the wrong thing. Then when it is brought up, it changes the aura of the room and the people within it. Yet even when it's not being discussed, simply the situation itself can bring about anger from the tiniest spark. Seen here in my favourite scene of the episode with the Milk Milk Lemonade segment, an entire ferocious argument kicking off from the smallest ignition, where the internal frustrations and grief spill out into the world. It was a fantastic moment where both actors shone, particularly Reese. There are small glimmers of hope as well, such as Chaz saying he is to the next nine years to Joe, despite this being very unlikely. Love is capable of breaking barriers, and just the idea planted in the mind of everything being okay is something which makes things a bit easier. Terminal illness is an awkward middle ground between life and death. It's funny because even healthy people can die at any time. Anyone with any state of health can die at any time. It's a certain uncertainty that is often kept behind the curtain of modesty. Yet when it comes to terminal illness, it's like a switch is flicked where that certainty rises to the surface and becomes a gloomy beast in the corner of every room. I thought the last weekend captured this extremely well, with some beautiful, succinct exchanges, not being afraid to tackle this very raw and destructive part of life. 
However, as we come to find out via the twist, most of these conversations hold no true meaning within the context of these characters. I still wanted to discuss them with their pre-twist context because I thought they were handled gorgeously and I'm sure that people who have personally tackled the chaos of terminal illness had a high chance of taking something from this episode. Yet, with the revelation that Joe hasn't got cancer and that this entire weekend is a revenge plot against Chaz, oh my goodness do the tables turn. This was one of my favourite number 9 twists since probably about series 5. There are a bunch of subtle hints in the dialogue in the episode that build to this twist, but I think they're some of the best disguised twist hints the lads have written in ages. They redirect you towards other seeds planted in the mind, like Joe cheating on Chaz or the cancer playing a role in how they treat each other. To me, this was night and day hint writing compared to Love is a Stranger earlier in the series. Anyway, the monumental shift in the last weekend comes via a shocking revelation. Joe actually had a family before Chaz and is arranged to be married to the mysterious Mick who has been sending texts throughout the episode and attracting focus. Back in his boy band days, Chaz bullied Joe's daughter Olivia via MySpace, telling her to kill herself, to the point she drank a bottle of bleach and ended up in an assisted coma for nine years before being switched off. Joe and his wife divorced during this process as well. Effectively, Chaz's pettiness and unthinking, unfiltered way of speaking, which we see throughout the episode, he has a level of sassy harshness about the way he talks, this led to the death of Joe's daughter Daughter, and now Joe wants revenge in an ice cold way. What a left turn this was. They do such a great job making you believe the genuine nature to Chaz and Joe's bond, that there is a lack of comfort between them, yet the reason for that discomfort is aimed towards the grief and the illness. It was masterfully masked, though there was one element that stood out to me as not making much sense. In an early scene, we see the toilet pan seemingly filled with blood, yet Joe Joe reveals he puts a bit of Vimtor down now and again to make it appear like blood-infused urine. Now, the reason this doesn't make sense to me is, surely this only has meaning if Chaz sees it? Otherwise, he's just going to pour the Vimtor down and then flush it away? In which case, what's the point of doing it in the first place? It felt like seeing this on screen was just for the audience and not for anyone of consequence within the context of the episode itself. Even if Joe had called Chaz into the bathroom, acting concerned to show him the red water, that would have given reason for his choice, but otherwise it stuck out to me as odd. The rest of the revenge twist itself, though, I found gloriously grisly. Joe blends quick-drying cement with Chaz's mud bath, spikes him with Xanax, and sends him to sleep. Via clever inclusions of an oat and honey face mask and continuity shots of insects outside the house, things get dark. Joe adopts scaphism, an ancient torture method of using honey and milk to attract insects and other animals to eat people alive, in order to pick off Chaz. He wanted Chaz to waste the last nine years of his life, just how the last nine years of Olivia's were wasted, and then he wanted him to be eaten alive, just like the grief ate away at Joe. That real anger that he expressed earlier wasn't the anger towards his cancer, it was the anger towards Chaz, veiled so well. The bitterness in Steve's eyes and voice when carrying out this scaphism scene, Christ, he is terrifying. And Reese's combination of heartbreak, guilt, and fear in his tear-filled eyes makes for a crushing counterbalance to this scene. To link it back to the five stages of grief that I mentioned earlier, this creates another direction, as Joe has gone through those five stages in relation to losing his daughter and his marriage as a result, yet again providing an entire new set of stages of grief within the episode. It's one of the most brutal conclusions to a number 9 episode for me, on the basis that it's not supernatural in any way, it's plausible. All of this episode's themes, from the cancer grief, to the revenge storyline, to the scaphism, are all grounded in the history of reality, yet are all more frightening than the supernatural, because, just like Chaz, they're cemented. 
For me, the last weekend was the best episode of Series 8 in every department by a country mile. Best concept, best twist, best Stephen Reese performances, most touching, most impactful. It delivered a shining glimmer of hope for Series 9 at the end of what was otherwise one of the weakest series of the show in my personal view. However, that's just what I thought, and I'd love to hear your thoughts too. I've now covered every episode of Inside Number 9 in some form, so do check out the Inside Number 9 playlist to hear more of my thoughts. Once again, don't forget to check out the Horror Exchange, as well as a sub to this channel if you appreciated the video. Well, that's Series 8 in the bag, and with Series 9 commissioned, I shall see you once again somewhere down the line for more honest reviews Inside Number nine. Cheers out.